report presentation for UDOT uh, uh, research project. Uh, the research is on database testing and decision process for traffic signal steel replacement. So uh, by the way, my name is Vincent, the project manager um, of this project. Uh, Professor uh, Andrew um, uh, Sorensen is the PI and UDOT Traffic and Safety champions it, this uh, uh, a project. And I guess, uh, Adam, you are the champion now, <laughs> Re uh, taking over, you know, Jesse. Um, we are recording this presentation and you can find this recorded uh, video uh, later on this week uh, in our research uh, website. Uh, before I turn the time uh, 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 to Andrews uh, and his team. And I would like to thank the tech and also traffic and safety, um, you know, uh, champion this um, and supporting this project. Um, if you had any question during this presentation, uh, put your, uh, type in your um, question in into the chat box. Then we will address those uh, after the presentation. Uh, also, Mute your micro, uh, microphones, uh, maybe turn off your, it's, uh, your, your camera, it's up to you. Uh, last, um, if you want to receive you know, the CE credit for this, you know, attending this uh, um, uh, presentation, uh, let me know. And I'm tracking you know, the, the attendance. Um, this, it's a new fe feature I just learned. Uh, from the this Google Meet, so I should have your names uh, at the end of the presentation. So just send me a text if you want a receiving a C credit for this uh, uh, for attending this uh, presentation. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the time to Andrew and his team. Go ahead. Thanks, Vincent. So I just want to take a quick second and introduce the research team that I've been working with here at Utah State. So in the room with me is Dr. David Unobe. He's a postdoctoral researcher uh, that's working uh, under me here at Utah State. And we also have uh, joining remotely Dr. Brennan Bean, who's in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And uh, he was a doctoral student when we started working on the project. And then he finished and is actually uh, an assistant professor now, so they, he's so good they just hired him right up as soon as he finished his PhD. Um, Brennan helped us collect a lot of the uh, statistical data uh, for the winds and also to develop the app uh, that we'll demonstrate at the end of this presentation. Uh, Brennan, we're, we're slowly converting him into a civil structural guy he worked with, uh, with Mark McGuire, a lot of you remember Mark, uh, on developing a new snow load model. Uh, that, was, that was some research that was funded by uh, ASCE, among other people. And so he's becoming quite the uh, structural loads expert. And uh, so we're thankful to have him on uh, the project. Uh, so we're going to start the presentation. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Unove. And he's going to give a presentation, and uh, Dr. Bean will also interject at a point. And then once we're done, uh, like I said, Dr. Bean will demonstrate the app that we developed as part of this project. So hopefully everybody can see this. We'll try and do the presentation mode, but if it slows down to where uh, you're not seeing the slide transitions, let us know and we'll just go back to showing the slides in the in the base uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, and good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having us here to make this presentation. Um, I'll be going over some of the slides, um, just talking about the process uh, we have developed, the framework we have developed. Uh, myself and Dr. Bean would um, generally be going over the different slides. So um, to begin, for the purpose of this project, um, two objectives were identified. Um, the first involved the design of an asset management 
framework for traffic signal structures. And uh, following that, um, another objective was the development of a tool to utilize this framework in um, to help with the decision making for retrofitting or replacement of these traffic signal structures. Um, to achieve the set objectives, a methodology was designed firstly to develop a historical wind load information data set for a particular location of interest. That is a location, an intersection with traffic signal structures installed. Um, this is was to be done using wind speed data from data collecting stations within proximity of this location. Beyond that, the wind history data set developed was to be used to um, compute the fatigue damage that has occurred on this on the traffic signal structures installed at this location, and uh, from then on extrapolate the possible fatigue lifespan of the structures. Um, at this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Dr. Bean to go over the process uh, developed for aggregating the wind speed data into a local wind speed historical um, data set for the location of interest. Yeah, th thanks, David. David, I, I will mention, and maybe it's just me, someone else can concur. I, I still only see the, the uh, intro slide, um, and it's not in presentation mode. I don't That's know. Correct. It's strange. There, now I now it's changing. Uh, okay, so just just go like that. That's fine. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, the the big piece of the project that I was involved in, obviously the app that we'll we'll talk about at the end, but was also just summarizing the wind data that we had to create a mechanism for predicting how much wind we would expect to see in a given year at any given uh, traffic pole location in Cache County. And so we collected uh, wind data, which was uh, usually on an hourly scale. Sometimes it was on a, a, a higher temporal scale, uh, 15 minutes. Um, but we collected these wind measurements um, and we converted them all to hourly wind measurements uh, using some details that are talked about in the report. Uh, at 31 stations, you can see those uh, on this figure here. And, it, and this figure is, is not meant to, to show you any precise wind speed that we're seeing, but it's, it's meant to show some of the patterns that we see in wind speed direction pairs uh, throughout the valley. So specifically, if you look at the mouth of Logan Canyon, which would be in the center of the plot north south and on the far right side you you see this station with this this these very strong wind speeds um in a in a particular direction and, and those are our for those that are familiar with cache valley our classic canyon winds um that um destroy students as they walk to class every single morning um and you can see then a differences in magnitude and also some asymmetries in the strength of wind in certain directions. And so one of the things that we tried to do is, is come up with a joint probability distribution. And, and David, maybe we can advance the slide here. A joint probability distribution of wind speed and direction. And we did this um, just using empirical data. So we, we essentially created a, a bunch of buckets. So we had a bunch of direction buckets. You can see this in the figure, um, the eight cardinal directions. And then we had a bunch of speed buckets. Um, we, we use a much finer resolution for the, the traffic poles. I believe we ended up doing uh, uh, divisions at every uh, half mile per hour or quarter mile per hour. Um, but for visual purposes, we show it at buckets of, of one mile per hour. And the idea is that we just counted the number of observations that we saw in each speed direction pair. And as was mentioned on the previous slide, we needed at least five years of data in order to use the station because our goal was to be able to create the typical year of wind speed direction pairs in what we would call a, a bivariate probability distribution. And so in this particular example, this is that uh, classic Logan uh, Canyon station where we see that most of the wind speeds are small, but we do have with high probability, strong wind speeds in the Southeast direction, but, but we don't have strong wind speeds in, in really any other direction. 
And so using these uh, uh, joint distributions, which we define at the 26 measurement locations that were retained throughout the valley, we, we ultimately use what's called inverse distance weighting to take a weighted average of what we expect the yearly distribution of wind speed and direction at any, any given traffic pole. And I, I think that, that that concludes this slide, and I'll turn it back over to you, David. Okay, um, thank you, Dr. Bean. So um, after developing what we could call a historical yearly uh, wind speed history for the location, um, the wind speeds are then converted to wind pressures and beyond that to wind forces. Um, essential to that is a knowledge of some geometric information of the traffic structure, including, of course, the length and diameter of the mast arm as well as the pole. Also, um, knowledge of the presence and dimensions of a luminaire arm and light, as well as number and types of attachments on the mast arm. Now, for the purposes of the demonstration tool, which I will be demonstrating later on, some of the geometric information was generalized for all structures, and um, this was um, uh, done utilizing some information from UDOT as to some um, generic uh, um, geometric information that applies to virtually all of the traffic structures within the state. This includes um, using a round cross section for all the poles and uh, mast arms, as well as a consistent taper, a consistent thickness, and also a consistent base diameter for the poles. Also, the geometric dimensions of all the attachments on the, that we placed on the mast arms were kept consistent, again, um, with respect to UDOT specifications. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the wind speeds are converted to wind pressures and then to forces acting on the mast arm as well as the poles. These forces are then used to compute stresses at critical, at um, fatigue critical locations, including the mast arm to its base plate connection, as well as the pole to its own base plate connection. Then the stress, <coughs> these stresses were computed um, using moments at this location, as well as some of the um, cross-sectional information at the location. The wind fatigue was then computed at this location. Um, firstly, by compute the stresses were used to compute the number of cycles to failure at a particular stress range, NF, um, and this was done using um, the standard bus wind relationship as shown here. Also, the corresponding wind speed that um, was used to create that wind stress range was also used to select a number of cycles that um, the traffic structure would be expected to have to have um, withstood within the time period. Then the fatigue damage is computed as a fraction of these two numbers. That's the number of cycles withstood over the number of cycles at a stress range to failure as per minus rule. Um, the total number of the total value for all the fractions across all the different stress ranges that would have occurred over a period of a year and um, beyond that over the period of the lifetime of the traffic structure is then summed together to determine the total um, damage that would have occurred to the traffic pole, again from wind fatigue at the particular fatigue critical locations selected. Um, here we have a couple, um, some examples of the demonstration of this other two. Now, um, the tool was primarily developed and, um, uh, for traffic locations around Logan, Utah. Um, here we have, as I mentioned, some of the design parameters, some of which were kept constant and others of which were allowed to vary. Um, as we'll be showing later on, some, there are some, some of the design variables um, can be selected as such, um, for a particular traffic structure in a particular location, it would be possible to actually um, know some of the geometric configurations for the structure and um, have them and set them up in order to determine the fatigue damage that would have occurred. Some of the other design parameters, on the other hand, are kept constant. Um, here, on this screenshot of the two, um, 
we have on the top right hand corner here a map showing in blue cycles the different traffic signal structure locations around Logan, Utah. And on the right side here, I have I show a table of the different uh, parameters utilized in determining the fatigue damage. For um, some examples, we used the tool to determine the fatigue damage and uh, by extension the fatigue life of different traffic structures just around um, the city of Logan. And here we have the results. These two tables show the results of uh, for, from the analysis. On the left side, table one shows the results for the pole to base plate connections for 15 traffic uh, signal structure locations around uh, with around the city. And on the right side, um, it shows the fatigue life of uh, the corresponding mast arm to base plate connections. Um, just a couple of observations from these results. Um, for the pole to base plate connections, most of these connections show an infinite fatigue life. Usually by Ashton specifications, um, fatigue life spans of over 50 years are considered infinite fatigue lives. However, um, one particular pole, that is the, um, the east-west bound traffic structure, at 1400 North and 10th West shows a fatigue life um, that's a little below the infinite fatigue life and, and uh, based on the installation date shows the time frame of having uh, just a little under 33 years left in service. That's about the lowest um, value we, we saw from across the different, from the fatigue, or the fatigue lives from across, from across the different locations. Uh, similarly, um, for the mass arm to base plate connections, most of them did show infinite, um, uh, infinite lifetime, except again for one particular traffic structure, which was the traffic structure um, at Hyde Park, right on the US 91 uh, State Highway. Um, this showed a, a fatigue life of a little below infinite, and uh, uh, we are here estimating that there is about uh, 25 years um, left in the life span, fatigue life span for that particular traffic structure. Um, again, to note, all of these results are in a way relative. What we have created here um, by developing the wind load history and <clears throat> beyond that, estimating the fatigue life of this different traffic structure is in a way to allow for um, some decisions to be taken as to inspections and perhaps replacement for these poles. We are not um, saying that these values here are in essence exact as to the fatigue life of these structures, but um, what, what we are showing here is uh, the possibility of having this tool for use as a means to develop perhaps um, an inspection schedule and uh, back, uh, viable inspection schedule for these structures. Um, at this point, I will turn it over to... Yeah, there, let me just make one more comment here about this. So, as, as David was saying, this these final two plots reflect a combination of known information and unknown information. So we did take into account the mast arm length, but these also are dependent upon the most recent standard traffic pole configuration and material. So if you look at the older ones that are in uh, in downtown on Main Street that are showing like 700 years of service life, we know that those materials uh, and the base plate configuration are not the same as they, as they are uh, using the current standard. But we also know those have been in service for quite a long time and, and aren't really showing any deterioration. So it, it is sort of a, a validation of the model. And in fact, the two that, that David points out, the 14th and 10th West and the Hyde Park one, those are our more rural area um, traffic poles. And so they're not as shielded. Right, so they do see more direct wind than, than the downtown ones. So once again, just looking at the results, as, as David said, they're not 
an exact approximation. Now we get pretty close to, to a actual prediction when we can put in the exact configuration, material properties, mast arm length, and, and that is allowed for in the model. Uh, but relatively, this, this does give us a pretty good idea, as David said, of which ones need closer inspection, right, more frequently. Uh, this also doesn't take into account galloping uh, from adjacent traffic, right? So we know that in the more rural poles where we have higher travel speeds, so for example, that Hyde Park and that, that 14th North, 10th, 10th West, those have higher traffic speeds than downtown and they have more truck traffic. So uh, we, we can also infer that there is additional fatigue due to that galloping. And then the last thing is also um, salt corrosion at the base plate especially is another issue, right? Uh, and that probably warrants a little more research in the future to look at maybe our, our salt application rates and corresponding corrosion uh, and how much of that is actually making it to the traffic poles. Um, so that's not taken into account here, but we know at the base plate connection that corrosion is also going to, to play a role. And that's sort of a, a multi-hazard fatigue scenario, right, where we would have corrosion and, and cyclic wind fatigue. Uh, so those, those two things are not taken into account in this model, but it still gives us a very good relative predictive model for identifying those poles that require a little bit more attention and really which ones uh, we can expect to be in service for a long time without needing too much attention. So with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to, uh, to Brennan to uh, demonstrate utilization of the app. So, Brent, hopefully you can present. Yeah, I'm hopefully pulling up the right thing. Um, <laughs> we'll see. I, I don't use Google Meets very often, but um, what I've pulled up is, can everyone see this um, uh, this, this dashboard? Uh, there's a little map of Cache Valley. Um, Andrew, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, because I I'm now going blind because I <laughs> I just I have the app up. So what we have here in the upper right corner is a point and click map of Cache Valley. So you can zoom in and out. Um, it does include uh, so the blue circles are the the places where we have traffic information based on what I was able to find uh, in the UDOT database. So it includes some things in Box Elder County, but the the app only works for poles selected in Cache County because that is where we had wind information. And so if I select a location, um, what happens is uh, in that moment that I click, there is an inverse distance weighting, which is just a weighted averaging scheme that takes the wind histories that we compiled for all of the measurement locations and creates a wind history for uh, that particular traffic pole location. Here is a visual on the right. Um, in, in this case, the, uh, the, the color scheme is, is, is not very interesting because we have maximum bin uh, sizes. If I change these, these just change the visual so that I can get a sense of um, where the winds are going. So for example, in the eight speed direction, it's showing me the probability of wind in the eight cardinal directions. If I switch it to four, it, it just makes it so the bins are bigger and there's a little bit more um, color separation. But all of these things that I'm doing in the upper left that change this plot are for visual purposes only. They don't change the meat of this uh, app, which is this table that's given here. And, and I'm on a much smaller screen than, than normal. Um, so it, it kind of falls down the page. But what we have are the um, estimated annual damages uh, for at the base pole as well as at the mast arm. And then we also have a, a years to failure. These values can be changed 
obviously they change when we select different locations because we have different wind histories. Um, and so you can see those values changing here. They also change when we put in different um, properties of the uh, particular traffic pole. So as we change the master arm length, um, change the master arm diameter, and we can also change the threshold at which we expect damage to occur from a stress. So from uh, the literature that we found, 4.5 is what was recommended, but, but that could theoretically be changed as it goes up. Naturally, we're saying that, you know, that it takes more stress to, to induce any type of fatigue damage. And so these, these years to failure go up as I click up. And as they go down, it would be the opposite. Uh, the last thing here is just a histogram of the arm stresses. Um, it just kind of shows you, um, gives you a sense of the distribution of the stresses observed in the east-west or in the north-south direction. We, we made the simplifying assumption that all traffic poles, and it's it's pretty reasonable for all, like except two in the valley, are are oriented in a strict north-south or east-west direction uh, because like we showed in the PowerPoint slides, uh, we, we don't see symmetrical uh, winds, you know, that we have wind blowing much stronger in certain directions, which is why we saw in the tables that David presented at the end that, that sometimes we're only seeing um, significant fatigue in a certain orientation of the traffic poles, but not necessarily in the other direction. Uh, I think that that is um, it as far as uh, demonstrating the app. Like we mentioned, uh, the, the great value I see in this is the ability to explore different configurations at different locations and get a sense of the relative fatigue. Uh, so when we go to downtown Logan, no matter what we put in, the fatigue lives are, are really high because they just don't have very strong wind speeds. But as we get to the mouth of the canyon or out into some of these uh, wide open places, we see the wind speeds go up and the fatigue lives uh, go down. So with that, I'll stop sharing. I'm happy to bring it up, but I'm I'm running blind here. And I I think we'll just open it to questions unless Andrew or David had anything else they wanted to add. No, I think we're we're ready to take questions. So like I said, Brendan can bring that app back up if you want to see the, the dashboard. Any question from from the tag here on this application? Uh, this couple. So, go ahead. Yeah, can, can you pull up the chat there, David? Yeah. So. Uh, so Rod asks, scaling question, how long to calibrate new locations and bring them online? Uh, Brendan can probably speak a little bit more to this, but uh, it's not that difficult. I mean, if we wanted to do this for the state, uh, Brendan basically designed a script that goes in to the websites that have uh, data for wind and automatically downloads them or we scrubs them is that the word you use brennan scrubs them for data basically i think is the a scrape yeah scrapes scrape, the sorry, not scrape, uh, scrape. scrapes yeah. the word um yeah the i i know that we had some issues we ended up having to go through synoptic labs for for some of the information uh not all of the the wind speeds were reporting to the federal database that is by far the easiest to scrape but um the the process for cleaning this data is uh, fairly straightforward, and uh, I mean, we we use state level wind records to to search for outliers and stuff. So, in terms of, and then the the interpolation method that we're using uh, that that um uh, you know estimates the weighted average between stations is it's a uh, it's an old method and it's lightning fast because it's not too complicated. So, uh, the the only limiting factor is just making sure that we have enough wind stations to say something substantial. Um, 
but once we have that, everything else is um, could be scaled very easily. As far as so, like the the locations of the the mast arms, that's already available. So Brennan pulled those from a UDOT GIS source. So pulling the rest of those for the state would also be pretty quick. Um, so I mean that's that's not the challenging. The challenging part is more in in Devin's question, which is um, having site specific information. And so the assumptions that we made, our basic input into the model was based off of the uh, the standard for a a new sign structure that would go in. So a new traffic arm that would go in using the, the basic, um, uh, what do I want to say, standard drawing configuration, configuration yeah. from UDOT. So that was, that's sort of our default that we, that we put in. Uh, on, the, on the information that we did get for um, the specific ones here in Cache Valley, as far as mast arm length and time and service, we were able then to to generate the you know some specific information but once again that's still based on new material which for the for the uh, 14th uh, 14th and 10th location and probably for the the highway 91 out in Hyde Park those that's a fairly reasonable uh, assumption because those haven't been in service that long uh, but the older ones in downtown, obviously, those are different. Uh, and so if we had more information about those uh, specific configurations and materials and time, you know, in service, then we can we can get a much more accurate. So hopefully that answered those two questions. If not, we're, we're happy to follow up again. Um, Michael, yeah, so we, we had talked, uh, I think including um, a factor for galloping due to vehicle traffic would, would be easy and extremely challenging at the same time. Uh, it's easy because we could easily put a factor, a reduction factor into the model that we're already using. Right or or do a summation where we would basically sum the number of fatigue cycles due to wind and then the number of fatigue cycles due to vehicle gusting and sum the two up to to get the the service life uh, number of fatigue cycles. The problem is is that there's not a model out there right now that we're aware of that sort of combines all of the different, like we know what causes it, right? It's a function of the type of vehicle, the vehicle travel speed, the distance from the roadway to the, to the base of the traffic pole, right? All of these things we know go into creating what that is, but there's not a specific model out there uh, that has this easily available. Like we know, we know that those factors play a role, but there's not one, you know, mathematical model or simulation out there that we could easily pull um, and say, yeah, that's going to, you know, based on our daily traffic counts and track counts and the travel speed, we can put this factor into. You know, if that if that information comes available, yeah, we can easily integrate that into the model, but it's just not out there right now. Um, perfect welds, once again, that's uh, that's an issue that we could also address with just a, a fatigue reduction factor uh, that we could easily put in and say, okay, we know that they're not perfect, and so maybe maybe we say. Uh, you know, 85% reduction factor for non-perfect welds. And that's that's a pretty uh, standard structural reliability type reduction. We do that with, with concrete, right? We already take a, 
a 15% a reduction for the strength of concrete in all of our concrete design. So that's, that's something we could easily put in there. And there is some statistical data out there on reliability of welds. And so we could easily justify uh, a reduction factor for that. And that would, that would reduce the, the fatigue cycles a certain percentage. Andrew, did you see the, the new chat question that came in about uh, rusting? Yeah, so I, I talked about this just a little bit before. Um, most, uh, from, from my understanding and, and what uh, uh, my talks, mainly with Jesse at the beginning of this project, a lot of the failures that we have seen in the state can, can most likely be attributed to uh, the rusting. Uh, Right where we have a pole that was hit and failed at a much lower impact velocity than expected, and that's because there was some some degradation uh, at the base plate. Uh, yeah, there would there would definitely, like I said, there's no study out there right now uh, that that looks at this and. And it's something I, I think we should look at because it's something that we deal with. And um, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of different factors, uh, application rates, how often they're applied, the distance from the roadway to the base plate, all of those are gonna uh, play a role in the, um, in that rusting. And I think we're, uh, I don't know a lot about it, but just in, in the U-Track meetings, in the preliminary meetings, I know that the, the maintenance division is doing a lot more with collecting data uh, in the actual trucks, like in the plow, plow trucks and the sanding trucks and all of that. And I think moving forward in the future, we could probably leverage some of that to actually collect data uh, and maybe do a semi long term study where we put some sacrificial, um, you know, plates or something out there and measure corrosion in some of these locations and then correlate that back to the, the information that we're gathering from the trucks. I'm sure Mark Taylor knows uh, more about that and maybe he wants to speak up because he's, he's pretty plugged into those kind of uh, data collection things. Uh, but yeah, I think that's, that's something in the future we could definitely look at and then integrate in with the model. Um, as far as uh, plans for the tool in the future, we're, we're still working on it on our end a little bit to um, kind of fine tune a couple things and look at it, as I, I mentioned before, maybe a little bit more from a reliability standpoint where we can then take into account like the imperfections of the welds and of the connections and the steel and things like that. Um, we, we will probably pitch something like this to some surrounding states like uh, maybe uh, Idaho and Wyoming and Nevada and see if there's any interest. Uh, but right now, this is kind of the end of the project for us here in Utah. So. Scroll, David, scroll back up just a little bit because I didn't catch that, that question. Yeah. Okay, I think we answered. Yeah. David, you want to? Yeah. So, um, there is, I think all of those factors would actually have an effect. Um, from what we saw in the results uh, for the traffic pools, like, uh, within the city of Utah here, um, we could note that the longer mast arms 
do have a significant effect on the fatigue life. Um, for the sudden corrosion, I cannot give an estimate as to the effect it would have, but I would definitely say it would have a degrading effect, uh, quite a significant degrading effect also. Um, the wind also is, of course, a significant factor, as we saw from the traffic poles, and those, uh, with, those with more open topography and those just out in the country, as opposed to the poles downtown, have a significantly shorter fatigue life. Um, so yeah, all those three factors will have an effect, and uh, I would believe like um, quite a large effect on the fatigue line. As to which would have the most effect, I believe um, it's it really is a it's really is a factor of other things like the topography, um, as well as some other things like the number of attachments on the mast arm. So really long mast arms do have an effect, but also really long mass arms, we say just one or two um, light attachments would not have as significant an effect as those we say four um, attachments on them. So um, yes, there is a mix as to what would have the most significant effect, but yes, all of those factors would have pretty significant effects. So, and the other thing with that, Mark, uh, as you're aware, you have the damper that uh, the folks at Connecticut developed, and those are on some of our longer mast arms here in the valley, and I'm sure you put those in other locations around the state. And so obviously those are designed to reduce uh, the effect of the longer mast arms. So if those are if those are present, then obviously we would pr probably expect the other factors to have more uh, yeah, so Rod's question, so I don't think we've had any um, failures due just to wind. We have had some due to crash related. And, and like I said, this just goes back to the discussions I had with Jesse at the beginning of the project. Um, all of the ones that, that he saw that had crash related failures, there was uh, corrosion present. So these weren't like new poles that had just been installed. There were some that had been in service and there was corrosion present, I think. Uh, I, and like I said, that's just according to my memory. One, one thing I'll chime in here, just when I think about this from a reliability standpoint, um, and, and all my work was snow, uh, one of the issues that we have with, with using failures that are observed to, to justify the current approaches is that it's it's a small sample size problem so like western idaho in 2016 hadn't had a failure it hadn't had any significant structure failures due to snow for perhaps ever um and then one big storm in 2017 and it, mass devastation lost their bowling alley their grocery store um 100 million dollars of of onion uh um uh onion product in their in their sheds and so it was something like 50 plus structures and so if you take an average failure per year in 2016 they look really good if you take it in 2018 they look really bad um and so uh, the more that we can 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 hone in on those extreme probability events and get a sense of what might happen uh is important because what has happened isn't always the most reliable metric for what could happen yeah, and that's, and that's a great point. I, mean, I have this discussion every uh, year when I teach structural reliability in that, you know, we design for earthquakes, but our statistical data on earthquakes is really low in Utah. So if we just go based off of, of past statistics, then we shouldn't be designing for earthquakes in Utah, right? But we know that's not the case. So it, it's not always a case where past performance predicts future performance. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, we, we are probably due for some wind fatigue event, just based on uh, some of the age of the poles that we have in service and an amount of corrosion. Uh, the, other, the other issue that we, we sort of have here in, in Utah, and like I said, this once again goes back to some of the conversations that I've had with uh, with Jesse in the past and with other members of the TAC at the beginning of the project was we we tend to replace traffic poles 
sooner because of expansion and and uh, lane widenings or whatever it is and so they tend to get replaced as part of those projects and so that's probably saved us some failures in the past yeah so the the base the base is is probably i would agree with michael uh with your with your comments there uh just because we see that's where we're going to get corrosion we're not getting corrosion at the mast arm connection at the base yeah we, we're seeing uh the corrosion there uh the base of the pool yeah has that longer moment arm so yeah i i think we can pretty well agree with the with your statements there yeah and um, just to uh, chime in a little bit here um also what we tried to do was um from literature we identified two critical um fatigue locations which were the base of the mast arm as well as the base of the pool so you would note that in the two, as well as in the report, um, we always try to report the fatigue damage at these two locations. Because um, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot predict in any way really which of these two locations would fail. Uh, we can, however, by um, computing the fatigue at these two locations, we can give an idea of what the damage is uh, at present at the two locations. So that's what we have done. We I've not selected one location over the other, but just uh, presenting the fatigue at both locations. Um, Rod, for so we did include the estimated age for the for the information that we were given here in Cache Valley. So the the final two tables in the presentation, you can see the remaining service life. So that included then how long they've been in service. Uh, subtracted from the predicted service life. Once, once again, I, I kind of want to return, there, a lot of these questions are great questions, and, and, but I kind of want to return to what was the objective of the project, and the objective of the project was to develop a, an asset management tool that basically helps UDOT identify which poles are more susceptible to failure and which ones need uh, more frequent inspection. It's not a, a tool to accurately predict to the day, you know, when we're going to see one of these poles topple over. It's really, it's meant to be an asset management and an asset prioritization tool. And that's why the relative failures are, are more important than the actual years to, to failure. And that, and, and that goes back to what, uh, a point that David made during the presentation, which is, you know, the AASHTO guideline says we should be designing these for an infinite life. Uh, and, and so it's really, like I said, it's about developing a method for managing these assets, more so than predicting the failure. Great. Uh, any other questions? Um, one one thing I forgot to mention in our you many of you have seen uh, or read the the report. Uh, it's from our from my um, from this uh, uh, appointment. So you can see uh, the research final report there. Uh, if you have any Further question, uh, welcome to reach out to uh, the research team or me. Uh, we can address your your question later. Um, so again, uh, thanks for the research team, you know, the tags and uh, UDOT traffic uh, safety to champion this. And 
uh, for the support and contribution to this project. And we thank you again. And uh, with no further questions, uh, this will con uh, conclude our presentation today. Thank you, guys. We'll see you a little. Uh, see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. Mm -hmm. See. You. Thank you all for your Take time, uh, Vincent. Yes. Um, so we do uh, want to talk a little bit about how would you like the app um, delivered. Do, do we need to put it on a, a thumb drive? How? Because we're that's going to take a little bit of of coordination because there's a lot of different files and things. Okay, how big is it? The Brennan, the memory. Brennan, do you have an idea of? Yeah, so the the app itself is almost no memory, but it does have to come with a a bundle of software that has some of these wind histories saved inside of it, and mm -hmm. so the big memory. Uh, like issue is is having that, so I'm, I I can actually pull it up right now, um, and and just see what the properties are on the file and let you know. Um, so the distributable version of the the software that goes with the app, that folder has just under twenty megabytes, so eighteen point four megabytes. Okay. So I, I mean, that's definitely not going to break anyone's bandwidth. And uh, in fact, we could take out, there's a, a few things in there that we could take out and make it about uh, 13 or 14 megabytes if I send the instructions separately. So not a big file, but maybe bigger than a standard email. Um, mm -hmm. so. Oh, yeah. so we could create like a box folder and put it in there, which you could then access and download. Um, and, and I think Brennan also included a, like a README file, right, Brennan, on some yeah. of those operations to get it up and running. And, and that's what I was saying. We could take those out to make the folder itself smaller. Um, another option we have, and maybe this would be the most straightforward, is USU has what's called a big file transfer system. It just lets me send a big email. Uh, so we send it out. You have seven days to download it on your machine, and then the link expires because so, they don't want to hold it forever in memory. But I mean, this that would be really easy for it. Twenty megabytes to do it that way. Um, and so, just let me know who I need to send it to, and and we can add a, one or two recipients. Or we, actually, we could add a bunch, but it just okay. would be a pain because I have to kind of manually. It's it's not as the system is not as convenient as regular email, but it's not terribly inconvenient okay why don't you you know send it to me send it to adam and also mark so let's do this uh, which, which mark vincent daniel uh, mark taylor? mark taylor okay perfect thank you mm -hmm. yeah if if uh andrew if you can just get me those email addresses since yeah. you probably have been conversing with them we can we can do that by uh within the hour so yeah so i go to uh mike right Okay. Okay. Um, I know I've got Adam and Mark and Vincent's email. I don't know about Mike Wright. I can give it to you. This is yeah. uh, Mike at thepinetop.net. Mike. Mike at, at pinetop.net. Pinetop. So he's not, is he a UDOT guy? I don't know that I know him. He's an actual consultant for us uh, that was on the call asking some of the questions, but he does a lot of our maintenance work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. M-I-K-E, right? Yes. All right. I, I, I will mention about this app that they, these are meant to be launched on, on the internet so anyone can use them. The reason this one's not launched is that that costs uh, like a monthly subscription to to maintain it. So um, instead, we run it locally on the machine to, but you need what's called uh, the R statistical software. Um, I'll send links to how you would download that. It's free. Um, and, uh, but so if, if this were something that Utah did want to scale um, for about $40 a month, we could probably figure out how to 
put it at a URL rather than having it be something you download on a machine so that anyone could access it via a website. But I, we obviously don't have the, the money to continue to maintain that at this stage. So, but just so you know what it was intended to, to ultimately become if it was something that was actually implemented. Great. And to to launch it is about forty dollars a month, so it's not a it's not a huge overhead to to maintain it. And then another company takes care of all the uh, the uh, um, the back end stuff. All right, great. Thanks. Hey, thanks, thanks guys. guys. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. See you.